we finally managed to write our paper one today, uh, the first exam of the 2023 exams. Our paper was two hours, it was 70 marks, and um, this is what we're going to go through. We're going to touch on certain parts and see um, on the level of difficulty that the paper gave us. Our comprehension is usual was 30 marks. Our summary was 10 marks in our language structures and conventions were 30 marks. Um, after discussions with the learners, uh, section A, B, and C had the suggested time allocation on instruction number nine, which is 50 minutes for uh, the comprehension, 30 minutes for the summary, and 40 minutes for the language and structures. Uh, uh, learners found it challenging. It was a very challenging paper. It was a technical paper, basically. We always get surprises at the, at the end of the year uh, on the first exam when we get to see the paper one that we've been given. And therefore, they struggled to finish, some of them. I hope it finished. They were requiring a lot of uh, thought. Uh, a majority of the questions were requiring a lot of thought. That's what they found difficult. The comprehension was very interesting and captivating because it's definitely what is um, relevant to us now. Remember, our comprehensions are now curriculum-based because they touch on what we are doing and they always touch on things that are, we are also uh, experiencing. A majority of us are, have been doing audio reading for our paper two structures instead of the print reading that we usually used to do. So as a result, we get to understand that it became familiar. But when they came to the questions, they were crying because a lot of technical questions were there. So as a result, we're going to touch on the comprehension a little bit. Uh, we're also going to touch on um, the question and the questioning technique and what we hopefully expected you to give or touch on in your answers. This is just a discussion of what was the range of the answers and the direction that the answers were supposed to go to. All right, let's go to the um, title. The title said, uh, listening instead of reading is not che 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 cheating. That is Gaby Hintz Leffer. When we say listening instead of reading is not cheating, we are saying that it's shifting from audio from print media to audio books because there's been a generational shift that is happening. Um, modern learners, modern readers now want to listen to the audio books and not sit down and read a book exclusively. So multitasking is happening because while reading at the same time, you can be doing what you are doing and therefore you are able to enjoy the experience while you're also covering something that you must be doing. A lot of examples we use, the cooking, I believe the the driving and all those things, the gymming or running somewhere. Uh, yes, so that's what was happening with this um, title. We're glad they gave you the um, glossary at the end. I think you saw it, yes, whereby we really had the challenge with the June exam paper, I believe where we had difficult words that learners couldn't understand. This is definitely a shift from our prelim paper. Our prelim paper was a provincial paper, but it was easy to go through. It was not challenging. But now when we look at um, the shift that happened in the paper, we discover that you just could not answer the questions immediately. You had to think deeply, you had to ponder deeply, and you had to go back, go back to the passage and try and figure out exactly what was being wanted from you. And as such, it became challenging. A lot of my learners asked me about, um, let's go to section B. A lot of my learners asked about section B because they had a lot of points. So they, they wanted to be sure whether they did it right. There were a lot of points actually, but as long as you gave your seven, it would have been fine. And it was um, a manageable summary. You just had to be straight to the points and you were done. Then we come to section C generally, when we're coming to our language structures and conventions, our advertisement was an um, enjoyable one, they said, because it had to do with um, fashion and they found it familiar as such, since it was based on a pair of jeans and therefore they enjoyed it. Um, and then um, 
There also was the cartoon, which was Calvin and Hobbes, which dealt with religion. Something surprising for us, I think all, because we're not expecting uh, uh, that theme to be dominating. Because I uh, remember it's, it's one of those challenging parts uh, that we're trying to figure out uh, how to answer. And a majority of the learners say they struggled with it because it was a bit difficult. I do agree with them. It was a little bit difficult because the content to them was abstract. And then language, finally, it was the language structures, which I believe some of them were manageable to do, but some, mm-mm, mm-mm. Uh, myself as a, as a as an educator, I had to question two questions or so to say, what is happening here? Uh, it, so it generally, it was a technical paper. So we just had to make a general comment to say, learners who actually um, giving concessions didn't finish, but learners who actually know their language very well, didn't struggle much, and they finished on time. Um, my best learner said finished in five minutes, which he, with five minutes left. Uh, so as a result, that was shocking because it means they also took time to try and answer the question. So I got worried about my weak learners who are still saying, ma'am, I'm still getting uh, what is this, a 45% or 42%. So they, those ones also say they didn't finish. Um, we'll see how it comes out. But remember, our paper one is always our language. And therefore, it becomes a little bit abstract for, for us in the exam. But we still need to go to revenge and in paper two and paper three. All right, let's go to the paper without wasting any time. When we're coming here to the audio books, I'm just going to touch generally on the questions and what we expected to be coming across. The first one says, why does the writer use the word it repeatedly in paragraph one? When we're coming to the word it being repeated, it referred to um, the reading through listening. So when we say insomniacs do it in the middle of the night, let's go back to uh, that paragraph one um, to internalize properly. It said here, insomniacs do it in the middle of the night. Um, so as a result, dog owners do it. So the second time while trudging around the park, some people do it in the gym, but lately I've taken to doing it alone in the car. So it was mentioned one, two, three, four times in that uh, first stanza. And the it, remember, is a pronoun, which refers to the um, reading. So as a result, um, this is the listening uh, to the audio book. While least you are in the gym, while least you are everywhere and all that. So now let's go back to the question because our question said, um, why does the writer use the word eat repeatedly in paragraph one? Uh, definitely it was an emphasis. You're supposed to touch on the emphasis part, um, the importance of reading or the method of uh, reading while doing something else. So we are talking about um, reading through the audiobook, which is listening to a book and not reading it manually or reading it uh, through print media. So as such, you have to be clear what it refers to there. That's what is revolving around the it being repeated there. And then it says, refer to paragraph two, explain why listening to audiobooks is regarded as a generational shift. I believe, uh, let's go to paragraph two quickly. Paragraph two said, listening that is, and perhaps more specifically, listening to things you might once have read instead, the growth of audiobooks, podcasts, and even voice notes, those quick self-recorded clips that are steadily taking over from type messages on WhatsApp, reflects a steady generational shift away from eyes to ears as the way we take it in the world and perhaps also in how we understand it. When we are talking about generational shift, we're talking about moving from the old outdated method of reading and now we are talking about a modern way of doing things technologically we have audiobooks now and therefore that's why we are not now reading using the eyes through print media we are reading using our ears uh, mostly so that's why we call it a generational shift technology came with a modern generation so as a result print media was the 
outdated old and way of um, reading through print media. But now we are shifting. The key word there was shift. That one. It was shift. So when we say shift, we are moving away and we are comfortably now in an era where we read through the eyes and therefore it's a new uh, comfortable preferred way of reading. That's what shift meant then. And then let's go to 1.3. What does the writer mean by the expression? Reading instinctively feels like the higher art. The key words that we're jumping out are the two. Instinctively and higher art there. So as a result, those are the two expressions we're going to focus on when talking about this. We're talking about intrinsically, uh, naturally, uh, without uh, uh, a thought. So when we are taking uh, instinctively, we are talking about naturally. It comes easily um, and as such. When he says it feels like the higher art, it, it, it's, it, it's done, as I say, it, intrinsically, easily, without any force. So those were the answers we are hoping we are moving towards when it comes to that expression. Um, and then it says, account for the use of the rhetorical question in, but is that fair, line 13, in the context of paragraph 3? Remember, a rhetorical question is always an engagement. It's a technical question, but it's always an engagement uh, of the reader, which is done by the writer. So it engages the reader to debate, to ponder more uh, on the advantages and disadvantages of uh, that is stated in line 13. Let's go to line 13 quickly to get the context because we have to be clear on what the pondering is based on. On line 13, it says, um, okay, there we go. It says, uh, reading instinctively feels like, where are we? All right, reading instinctively feels like the higher art, perhaps because bedtime stories used to be strictly for children and oral storytelling is associated with more primitive cultures in the days before the printing press. When we say, um, this is a transition, when we say instinctively, but now it's talking about uh, it was only done with the olden culture of reading to children through the book all right but is that fair so now he brings in the the reader to make a decision based on which is more uh appropriate is it the newer modern version or is it the old version of print media that is more appropriate so which means it was engaging the reader to ponder deeply about which type of method is best um, for uh, the situation that he talks about there um, during that time. So that's what the answers are going to be focusing on. But it is definitely engagement of the reader, um, pondering and debating and trying to come up with an answer. And then account for the use of, discuss the irony evident in paragraph five, uh, he says. We are going to go back to paragraph five again. Yet the idea prevails that listening is slightly or unserious. It's not to 55% of respondents to one EU Gov survey back in 2016 deemed audiobooks a lesser way of consuming literature. And only 10% thought listening to a book was only equal to reading it. The view that listening is cheating prevails, even though nobody thinks it is lazy for a student to sit through lectures and going to the theater is not considered intellectually inferior to reading the play at home. One study by Beth Rogoski, Associate Professor of Education at Bloomsburg University, asking students either to read a nonfiction book or listen to the audio version found no significant difference in how much of it they absorbed. Okay, the question say discuss the irony evident in paragraph five. Um, he gave us this contradiction, this one. Remember, irony is always a contradiction. There must be two contradictory views there, right? The survey by YouGov deemed audiobooks, this one, a lesser way of consuming literature, which means audiobooks uh, are read less. And then he went on again and said, uh, 
the view that listening is cheating prevails, even though nobody thinks it is lazy for a student to sit through lectures and go in the theater, is not considered intellectually inferior. So at the end of the day, there is one study by Beth Roth of Associate Professor asking students either to read a nonfiction book or listen to the audiobook version, found no significant differences in how much of it they absorbed. There was our, um, our contradiction. There is no difference between the two, yet they still found that audiobooks are read less. But now the professor is finding that if I give them fiction and I still give them an audio book, there's no significant difference between the two. Yet a survey up had said audio books is a lesser way of consuming literature. That's a validation to say statistics is given there. I believe only 10% thought listening to book was only equal to renting it. So we understand that there is a contradiction there when we say audio books are read less, but there's still no difference between reading a book and listening to an audio book. That was our irony there. All right, let's go on to the next one, which is 1.6. Refer to paragraph 6, lines 42 and 47. We had challenges with this one with so many contradictions as educators. We had so many contradictions because we tried uh, to figure out exactly what they mean. Let's go to 42 to 47. That. All right, there it is. 42 says, and to hear a book read by its author is sometimes easier. I'm going to just underline things that we'll refer to, to understand by the inflections of their voice and meaning you would not otherwise have picked up. Voice not suit the perennially anxious young in much the same way because they are less intrusive than a phone call and harder to misunderstand than text. It was page 47, okay, line 47. People can hear when you're being ironic, lessening the risk of accidentally causing offense. This is skepticism. We had a lot of different answers for this one, but we assumed skepticism is one of the tones that we saw. We are yet to see, but I'm going to touch on the one that we might have tried to stick to. And we thought skepticism came in there. Um, and then it says, uh, comment on the suitability of the tone used. Suitability of the tone, we touched on um, this one. It, it is suitable because um, it makes you conscious of uh, either sending a voice note because you might be giving away your all when you're sending a voice note uh, or a phone call. And then... Um, and then we also touched on the issue of uh, easier to understand because you are listening to it and therefore registering it at your own pace. The inflections of their voices is going to help. So we thought he's skeptical because he brings in the two views and is worried and doesn't make a clear mark on where he stands between the two. So he brought the irony as well there about... Um, People can hear you when you're being ironic, lessening the risk of accidentally causing offense. We are yet to see it. An assumption, remember, for this one, because we had a lot of contradictory views as the educators as well. So we'll see. All right. Uh, and then I believe we're going on to uh, 1.7. Critically discuss how the diction in paragraph 7 conveys the writer's attitude towards print media. Very sentimental, we believe. It says, provide two examples of diction in your response. Let's go to paragraph seven. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, sentiments there on paragraph seven. We had words like, it says, you can, what troubles me most about listening, I suppose, is that it is harder to share. You can recommend a podcast to a friend, but you cannot leave it on the train seat for the next person when you get off, as I have done all my life with Finnish newspapers. You cannot give your goddaughter your dog eared, spine cracked copy of an audio book that meant, oh, sorry, uh, that meant everything to them. It says, um, let me just remove this quickly. My apologies. Okay. It says, uh, that meant. Um, where were we? Everything to you when you were age. You will never buy an old audiobook from a second-hand store. 
and find somebody else's fate had not scribbled in the margin, a long forgotten postcard used as a bookmark that makes you want to know about the life of the person who sent it. Paper does not render itself useless in a power cut. We talked about the dog yet to show that it's been there for a long time. That shows sentiment and preserving it. And then we also found, uh, we also touched about bookmark. We also touched on bookmark and thought it might be appropriate. Uh, and then we also thought about, uh, there's another one that we touched on. I've, what is this? As I've done all my life with Finnish newspapers. Um, everything to spine cracked also came in during our discussions. Um, everything to you also came in. So there were various, there were lots that you could, could have been picked out, but we thought it's a sign of sentiment. So we felt that the um, attitude towards print media is a sentimental one. Uh, that's what we assumed uh, when we came to that stanza because of the expressions of the memory. And then we went on to uh, 1.8, it says, refer to paragraph 8, is the final paragraph an appropriate conclusion to the article. We were expecting this this one. Learners were expecting it as well. And I believe it was appropriate because it is a bold declaration that he accepts both types of reading. Um, and as such, uh, the underlying is that press reading will never... Um, be extinct, it will always be there and therefore it will have to be done in alignment as well with um, listening to the audiobook. So he is now accepting both types of uh, reading, the listening while reading and the reading from print media. So as such, we, we felt it is a, an appropriate conclusion as, as it is a bold declaration of him accepting the both forms of reading that are there in the passage. And then the underlying message was um, to the articles that press reading will never be extinct. So we felt that's what he was running at there in that final paragraph of the conclusion. And then it says, refer to the verbal text, they... Lena said they enjoyed question text B more than text A. I think um, I don't blame them. I really don't blame blame them. It says, how does audible.com contribute to a more enjoyable journey? Um, we, we touched on the issue of um, you are doing something else. You are on a journey. You are driving. But at the same time, it allows you that is audible.com allows you to enjoy your favorite adventure book and animate it and bring it alive while at least you're on the journey. So we, we thought it made it more exciting, um, more daring because it is an adventure after all. So that's what we touched on there. And then you say it's 1.10. So you have plenty of time to let your imagination explore the jungle. Identify how the imaginary jungle is depicted in the visual image provides its purpose. Let's go back a little bit because we touch on animation. There's ones. Yes. We touch on the animations. There's ones. So we touched on um, animation is showing a mental image coming alive while listening to the audio book, which is seen by the, um, headphones in the ears and therefore that's what we touched on we touched on the tiger um, the snake um then we touched on the earphones and then we touched on the driving as well so those are the things that you could have rotated on when talking about uh this one um imagery jungle Imaginary, sorry, imaginary jungle is depicted in the visual image. So those are the things that we touched on in the animation part. And then it says, comment on the effectiveness of the portrayal of uh, women in conveying the message uh, of text B. Um, a majority of them touched on, uh, what is this? Um, earphones give her the maximum concentration on the, on the audio book. And therefore, right in front of a visual, 
or a vision, right in front of a vision, the animals in the adventure story are coming alive. Uh, yet she is focused on the road ahead. So we also talked about the focus on the road ahead, that one, but also talked about the ears. It's also bringing the um, images alive to her, imagining the the animals. So those are the things that we touched on. Message of text B that you can enjoy your journey while listening to an adventure-based book or novel. All right. And then refer to what text and B. Learners were expecting this one. This is the trend that we've been trying to instill in learners for a long time to say, you must find the connection between text A and text B. And they were smiling on it, though they struggled above, but they were smiling on it to say, yes, I managed to get a connection between text A and text B. Refer to both text A and text B. Say it, it was a demanding question because it wanted to you to touch on the subheading. It, it was a demanding question, subheading. And then it also wanted you to touch on paragraph four of text A, it also wanted you to touch on text B. So it was demanding actually, but I think they did all they could. And though they might not have the full marks, but at least they got maybe the two or the three there. I believe that um, text B touches on reading while driving, showing a shift from print media to focusing on listening to the audio book and bringing it alive in your imagination. And then the subheading, let's go back to the subheading quickly. The subheading, oh, sorry. The subheading talked about from audiobooks. This is our subheading, by the way, from audiobooks to podcasts and voice notes. There's a steady generational shift in the way we understand the world. Uh, they touched on this one, steady generational, because they talked about a new form of reading which is coming up with uh, technology children and as such it means that we are definitely shifting from old reading through print media through the eyes but now we on the reading through the ears so it reinforces they also talked about it reinforces the enjoyable experience that is coming with a uh, reading through listening so those were the things that you could have touched on and expanded on. Oh, we had a lot of three marks. We had a lot of three marks. I think we had uh, three, six, nine, twelve, uh, twelve marks with three marks, if you realize, which was challenging for us, honestly, because that's a lot. Twelve marks with technical questions. There, but there we go. We have our three marks there. That's our first three mark. Three, six, there we go. We had three, we had three there, we had three there. Oh, gosh, we had three there. That's why we call it a technical paper today because of the, and then we had a four mark, which means uh, 16 marks was purely technical understanding and answering. And then the rest were lower order one in two questions, which means that you could easily apply yourself to them. That's our comprehension. Um, let's see. You can still capitalize in question two. Ten marks was supposed to come from the summary, boys and girls. This was our easier section that we could have easily uh, scooped all marks on. He says, text C discusses the benefits of silence. Summarize in your own words how silence helps one to cope with everyday life. Remember, you are not supposed to lift, but you are supposed to use your words, your own words here and there. All right. We're only taking uh, what is helping one to cope with everyday life right all right the world around us is often a difficult place in which to cope nope many of us tend to lose focus and find it difficult to remain consistently productive that's the introduction we're not taking anything there with all the distractions of our daily lives it is easy to recognize that we need less noise in order to keep our concentration how silence helps one to cope with everyday life as a result, how does silence help us cope? Less noise helps us to keep our concentration. That's our first point, definitely. Definitely. A little less noise is good for our well-being. That's very true. That's our second point. One of the major reasons why silence has become an important part of everyday life is that it provides one with the ability to focus. We are taking that definitely because the modern world and its various noises enter one's brain all at once. A silent environment helps one to concentrate optimally. Uh, okay. 
I believe you could have an ability to focus and concentrate optimally. So which means this was all. So which means I'll use the slash to say you could have taken this one or that one at the end of the day. The one was coming from there because it's slightly the same idea, but in different ways. So as a result, let's go on. If people's attention is always being drawn away through daily distractions, they will love, never know how their lives can be improved. Quiet time for self-reflection is important to make a conscious Im improvement. That's our point. Routines of our lives, that's our point. Stress is one of the most difficult aspects of modern life. True, a period of silence each day allows one the chance to relax. Thereby, this is our point. Chance to relax thereby reducing stress levels. There is a link between the level of noise that children are exposed to and their performance as students. The more noise children are exposed to, the more difficult they find it to concentrate. Moreover, in the 21st century, the exposure of children to a plethora of electronic devices has resulted in hearing impairment, which also affects their achievements as students. Remember, we said we only want to how it helps, right? Okay. In an article in Inc., research suggests that remaining silent increases the production of new brain cells. That is relevant. Taking time to daydream may improve. To daydream may improve productivity tenfold. That is our point. Right. In today's fast-paced world, almost everyone is a short fuse for frustration. Learning to relish silence cultivates calm and peace that's our point when silence is practiced regularly tolerance levels improve that's our point people will have more patience with daily irritations like traffic jams uh more patience definitely that's our point let's count how many points are we having now we have definitely we have one we have two we have three we have four we have five we have six. Okay, let's continue down. We have, okay, six there. We're going here. We have seven, and then we have eight. We have nine, and we have ten. So we have ten relevant points. Good summary today. That's the only thing that made us smile today. Ten points onwards as much as possible. Paragraph summary, word count at the end and not exiting. Then you get your beautiful ten marks. Okay. I pray we still do not have learners doing the point from summary at the end of this year because that's an easy 10 marks. All right, let's go to question number three. Our question number three is our advertisement, which learners wrote which was much better than the cartoon. I agree as well professionally. All right, let's go to our advertisement. It says um, Levi's 505, TM Jeans, no ordinary flight of fashion. Uh, call them fashion classic if you like. Just simply honest, 100% cotton jeans that never wear out. They will come never, no, never. Even that comfortable fit grows friendlier with every wearing. Pre-shrunk, zipper fly, Levi's 505s, five, timeless, dependable, uncomplicated. Sometimes don't you wish everything was a little more like that? Available in petites juniors, misses, and women's sizes. All right. Oh, my learners. Some of my learners did not know which was the logo because they confused this, this part. They confused it as the logo, yet this was our logo. Oh, gosh. English home language is going to bury us alive. All right, let's go to the questions. How does the image of the birds link with the phrase, no ordinary flight? Okay, we touched on elements when we we're looking at it just now and touched on elements of uh, pattern. Yeah, we went to this, we zoomed in on the pattern. We're talking of the different formations. We have this formation. We have this formation. We have this formation. We have this formation. So we touched on the different formations or patterns that are in each line, which shows that there's nothing ordinary about their flight. They are using different form formations, but moving in the same direction, though different formations. So that's what we touched on. It was a one mark anyway. We move. Account for the use of the phrase fashion classic. Okay, when we talk about fashion classic, we talked about lasting for several reasons. 
lasting for several years, excellent style, quality. So those are the answers that we're popping up for there. So any of those was acceptable and well discussed, you could get away with that one. Is I'll repeat again, we talked about lasting for several reasons, lasting for a while, excellent style, excellent quality. So that's what we were touching on. And then uh, the next one says, um, explain the persuasive appeal of one stylistic technique used by the advertiser in the written test text. Okay. When we were touching on this, we saw the personal pronouns as well. Yeah, with them, you, we touched on the personal pronouns. Um, made them so personal. It made the, um, the advertisement more personal. So we also talked about that. Um, there was that one first. Uh, and don't you, there were a lot of personal pronouns that, yeah, those definitely are the ones, three or so, that we touched on um, when talking about the persuasive style or technique that was used. Uh, the first one was the use of personal pronouns. And then the second one was the use of the punctuation, where we have the uh, question mark, uh exclamation mark used in the same line there's the question mark and so forth so we also talked about that one uh engagement of the reader is definitely also being done through those two and then also someone talked about uh emotive language uh they talked about um friendlier yes they also talked about never way out they also talked about uh Petites. And then they also talked about Prishang. So there were lots that they touched on. To say that becomes emotive language that moves and catches the reader's attention or creates a desire in the reader according to their size of which one to take. But they must know that whatever size they are, the genes will fit comfortably. The yeah, the genes will um comfortable was also in. They took it as well. Friendly as well, yeah. So those are the things that we touched on. So we found three stylistic techniques. There may be more. Yeah, there may be more than that, which is possible. And then comment on how the depiction, we go on with the questions. It says comment on how the depiction of the woman reinforces the message of the advertisement. We were talking about um, comfortable driving um message showing enjoying the ride very relaxed looking very relaxed looking comfortable uh which means is enjoying the ride but at the same time the enjoyment is uh added on by the um the imaginary animals coming alive through the visuals that are there uh, to showing is also enjoying the audio book so that's what we touched on when we talked about the woman. And then 3.5 says, just simply honest 100% cotton jeans that never wear out, they are welcome. The word welcome has been used as a noun in the above sentence. So in this instance, it was not being a noun. We had to use it now as a verb in a sentence of choice, which means uh, an action is being done we said uh things like the class should welcome the new learner warmly so welcome there becomes a verb yeah when you say the class should welcome the new learner warmly so we just gave an easy example there but it had to shift and become the 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 verb so you had to change it from there account for the use of apostrophe in labels in the logo of the advertisement it's definitely possession as i said learners confused some learners not all of them some learners confused this was the actual um logo and it's definitely uh possession belonging to sorry i know how it feels right now when you say oh i wrote it as a contraction just definitely a possession all right, let's go to question number four. Oh, I didn't like this one. I didn't like this one. The content itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. 
religion is the last thing that we expect because we've been talked so much about it so ah uh, but still we got it so it's fine we are going to go through it um let's see what we have all right it says you know i don't think calvin and Hobbes. yeah we were expecting that yeah, we're expecting Calvin and Hobbes, all the cartoons that we're expecting, Lapiro, all those, we're expecting them, but this one came definitely. There's a lot of irony and all those things. You know, I don't think myth is a science. I think it's a religion. A religion? Yeah, all these equations are like miracles. You take two numbers and when you add them, they magically become one new number. No one can say how it happens. You either believe it or you don't. Let's go to frame three. This whole book is full of things that have to be accepted on faith. It's a religion. Frame four. And in the public schools, no less. Call a lawyer. As a math atheist, I should be excused from this. All right. All right. Our question said, um, refer to frame one. This one. Let's go to frame one so that we can do it again. You know, I don't think myth is a science. I think it's a religion. A religion. And then our question says, provide one indicator reflecting Hobbes confusion. We're focusing on Hobbes, right? Hobbes has a finger scratching the side of his head. That's an indication. Definitely, it's a one mark. We move on. Finger scratching the side of his head to show the confusion that he's experiencing. Easy, that one. How would Hobbes' tone change if a religion were to be written in a jacket speech bubble? Jacket speech bubble usually shows shouting, loudness. So we say the tone will be to shock. The tone will change from confusion to shock as he will be shouting it out if it's a jacket speech bubble, um, which will be emphasis of the shouting. So that's what we took there. And then number 4.3 says... Refer to frames one and three only. With close reference to the verbal clues in these frames, discuss the change in Calvin's viewpoint. All right, we argued about this one, but we'll just give our general consensus here. We touched on, um, I don't think, I think we chose an assumption, but in frame three now, there is no assumption because it says it, which means it's definite, it's a religion. So we saw the shift in the, the change of Calvin's viewpoint from assum being a, a, assumptive and now changing to become uh, confirmed and definite that it is a religion. So that's what we argued against. Though we there are various reasons that can come in, so we're just going to give the one that came to our minds at the moment. And then it says critically discuss how humor is created in the final frame. We had two answers for this one. Actually, two answers came in. Because one of them, the first one that came in was irony. People say it's irony because um, they believe that um, frame in um, Calvin, it said critically discuss how you is created in the final frame. This one. As a myth atheist, I should be excused from this. Now, we say the irony is in Calvin uh, showing enthusiasm of uh, taking myths as a religion. But now in the final frame, he calls himself an atheist and distances himself. He distances himself uh, from the whole issue. That's what uh, was ironic. Someone also said it's an anticlimax because Calvin now changes his view at the end. So we just are giving the assumptions. Remember, we are still here to see which one they cycle on. But we had two. We had irony. We had anticlimax. So people felt both of them were coming in so we're going to leave it at that and then also it's a provide the suffix required for the adjectival form of religion religious was coming in without fail we were going to religious there a majority of us had religious in place so as such people added the suffix which is uh what is this religious so they talked about let me write here um, they circled on religious i believe yeah, we go here. They settled on religious. Oh, sorry. They so they touched on religious as putting the I O O U S at the end, and then they say give a synonym for lawyer. We are here now, lawyer. Okay, 
there were several that came in, legal practitioner, attorney, counsel, legal counsel. So there were a lot that were coming in as the answer there. So any was appropriate. We felt that it was difficult to understand, but I believe learners were happy to see 4.6, we're happy to see 4.5. 4.4, we're still working to see which one they accept as the Yuma. But uh, if they accept both of them, it means they are safe. 4.1, they were safe. And 4.2, they were safe. So as much as the content was difficult, we felt that it at least six marks were coming out or seven marks a day. All right. And then we go to question five. Question five is our most difficult every year. Yeah, in, yeah, out, we get challenges. Read text F, which contains some deliberate uh, errors and answer the set questions it says. Let's go to our interesting text. Learners miss some things here. As educators, we're crying over a certain question. So as such, we'll just have to also wait for the actual answer and try and figure out which one was coming in. I think we are really going to be... Uh, Mm, we are going to uh, get a surprise, but we were expecting surprises after all. We were surprised. We're not happy about the surprises, but we'll get over them. When Ebele and Nua stopped, it said how Africa is giving fast food a new spin. When Ebele and Nua stopped for a bite to eat at his local fast food restaurant, the queue of people snaked all the way to the car park. The young investment banker decided to start his own fast food eatery. In 2004, he opened Kilimanjaro, a chain of fast food restaurants, which today has 20 outlets across Nigeria. The company is one of a growing number of fast food restaurants to sprout across Africa recently. Kenya and Nigeria offer the desirable ingredients of an expanding maker class and a strong private sector backbone, they say. Uh, says Elias Schulz, managing partner at Africa Group. And then he says, some international chains have tailored their products to local tastes. Popular local ingredients have been added. In Nigeria, Domino sells pizza topped with jollof rice, a West African staple. KFC in Kenya offers a product based on ugali, a popular maize-based porridge. Apart from their profound knowledge of local homegrown taste, their chains are also adapt at managing a business in challenging circumstances, such as when electricity is in short supply. The other main obstacles include challenging and underdeveloped supply chains, weak logistics networks, sensitive local partnerships, and an unhelpful regulatory environment, says Schultz. He added that ultimately, it was a gamble on the future, adapted from editioncnn.com. The humor in this one is that after the examination, my learners quickly ran to say, is there anything called Domino cell pizza topped with jollof rice? And they were busy now sharing on our group chat that the pizza, pizza does exist. At least they managed to relieve their stress a little bit and say, oh, yes, it's there. Uh, they didn't think it was real, but someone proved it to uh, later on around 1 p.m., 2 p.m. to say, Guys, the pizza is real. So I kept asking myself, what is pizza topped with jollof rice? It is an African staple. It does exist. There was so, so much in tears with uh, due to the laughter that they were sharing. It says, refer to the title, replace the word spin with a formal English word. There are so many that arose. There are so many that came up because this is part of the title. It said how Africa is giving fast food a new spin. Angle, twist, turn, there were a lot. Turn around, there were a lot that were popping up. I know you also came with the right ones. There are a lot that came in there. Provide the homophone of Q. Oh, Lena's were crying. They were crying. Oh, this one. Oh, my gosh. Lena's were crying. Guys, people were crying because of the, what is this one? This. Oh my gosh, my learners, it's this one. It's the C-U-E, guys. The homophone for Q is this one. It's Q. They cried tears. See, I couldn't even remember that. But all the same, let's go on. Replace the commas in line three and four with suitable alternative punctuation marks. 
All right, so um, let's go to lines three and four then. There we go. It says he opened Kilimanjaro. We put the brackets. We felt the brackets were coming in there. Uh, okay. We put in the brackets to show parentheses. Uh, because it's a description that comes in of Kilimanjaro, which is the name. It's a chain of fast food restaurants. So we felt the brackets would also fit in there. I'm sure there are a lot that they're going to come in as well. Um, and then it said, correct the Concord error in paragraph two. Right. Kenya in Nigeria offers the desirable ingredient of an expanding middle class. That sounds wrong. Kenya in Nigeria offer this one to come out, not offers. So that's our concord. It's Kenya and Nigeria offer the desirable ingredients. That's a concord error. Some international chains have tailored their products to local taste. Rewrite the above sentence in the passive voice. There are so many versions that we've given, but one that we thought maybe might come in is, um, what is this one? We felt products have been tailored to local taste by some international trade chains so we started with products and then we went to have been tailored we changed the tense it have been tailored to local tastes and then we say it by some international chains we had to see i will say but that's what we finally stuck on because there were so many different versions that came up of that passive voice uh, maybe we'll get many versions we'll see provide an antonym for the word profound in the context of line 13 Let's go to line 13. Line 13 says, um, which is line 13? Oh, okay. Apart from their profound knowledge of local homegrown taste, uh, we felt it's uninformed, superficial, uneducated. Any of those were appropriate there of uh, that word. Okay. And then we move on to question... Um, Question, remove the redundancy in paragraph three. All right. We felt the redundancy in paragraph three was here. Local homegrown is to, one of them is to come out. So we thought Lena said to just remove homegrown and just write it as, so which means we're canceling out. We say it, it becomes apart from their profound knowledge of local tastes. You could have said, apart from their profound knowledge of homegrown taste, it was still fine. So one had to go out. You cannot use both because that's unnecessary repetition. Uh, we are uncircled on this one. So we're going to leave it open for now. We are so uncircled because we had so many arguments and uh, unfinished thoughts about it. So we we'll just have to be the only one in this question paper. That will just have to leave open for there. And then say some international, oh, no, 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 we've done this one. The last one said um, he added ultimately it was a gamble on the future, line 18. Rewrite the above sentence in direct speech. Okay, uh, we had this version that came up. We had this one. I believe it says uh, he added, we started with, He added, um, comma, open quotes, ultimately, it is a gamble on the future. That's what we thought, full stop. And then close quotations. So that's what we had is the direct speech. That was our 70 marks. Very challenging for two hours. All the best in our paper two. That's where you get your revenge. And in your paper three, please prepare thoroughly. Please internalize all your content to try and um, um, add on on what you already have. You have your paper one done and dusted. Now you can easily focus on your paper two and your paper three. Um...
we finally managed to write our paper one today, uh, the first exam of the 2023 exams. Our paper was two hours, it was 70 marks, and um, this is what we're going to go through. We're going to touch on certain parts and see um, on the level of difficulty that the paper gave us. Our comprehension as usual was 30 marks. Our summary was 10 marks in our language structures and conventions were 30 marks. Um, after discussions with the learners, uh, section A, B, and C had the suggested time allocation on instruction number nine, which is 50 minutes for uh, the comprehension, 30 minutes for the summary, and 40 minutes for the language and structures. Uh, uh, learners found it challenging. It was a very challenging paper. It was a technical paper, basically. We always get surprises at the, at the end of the year uh, on the first exam when we get to see the paper one that we've been given. And therefore, they struggle to finish, some of them. I hope it finished. They were requiring a lot of uh, thought. Uh, a majority of the questions were requiring a lot of thought. That's what they found difficult. The comprehension was very interesting and captivating because it's definitely what is um, relevant to us now. Remember, our comprehensions are now curriculum-based because they touch on what we are doing and they always touch on things that are, we are also uh, experiencing. A majority of us are, have been doing audio reading for our paper two structures instead of the print reading that we usually used to do. So as a result, we get to understand that it became familiar, but when they came to the questions, they were crying because a lot of technical questions were there. So as a result, we're going to touch on the comprehension a little bit. Uh, we're also going to touch on um, the question and the questioning technique and what we hopefully expected you to give or touch on in your answers. This is a, just a discussion of what was the range of the answers and the direction that the answers were supposed to go to. All right, let's go to the um, title. The title said, uh, listening instead of reading is not che 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 cheating. That is Gaby Hinz Leffer. When we say listening instead of reading is not cheating, we are saying that it's shifting from audio from print media to audio books because there's been a generational shift that is happening. Um, modern learners, modern readers now want to listen to the audio books and not sit down and read a book exclusively. So multitasking is happening because while reading at the same time, you can be doing what you are doing and therefore you are able to enjoy the experience while you're also covering something that you must be doing. A lot of examples we use, the cooking, I believe the the driving and all those things, the gymming or running somewhere. Ah, uh, Yes, so that's what was happening with this um, title. We're glad they gave you the um, glossary at the end. I think you saw it, yes, whereby we really had the challenge with the June exam paper, I believe where we had difficult words that learners couldn't understand. This is definitely a shift from our prelim paper. Our prelim paper was a provincial paper, but it was easy to go through. It was not challenging. But now when we look at um, the shift that happened in the paper, we discover that you just could not answer the questions immediately. You had to think deeply, you had to ponder deeply, and you had to go back, it, go back to the passage and try and figure out exactly what was being wanted from you and as such it became challenging a lot of my learners asked me about um let's go to section b a lot of my learners asked about section b because they had a lot of points so they they wanted to be sure whether they did it right there were a lot of points actually but as long as you gave your seven you would have been fine and it was um, a manageable summary you just had to be straight to the points and you were done then we come to section C generally when we're coming to our language structures and conventions.